Hi, good morning or good afternoon officially now. I'm just waiting for all the participants to be joining as the number goes up um, and then we'll formally start it in around kind of 10 to 15 seconds. Cool. Right, let's make a start then. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, for those that, that don't know me, my name is Mark Whitaker. Um, I'm um, a chair of, of IWFM um, and previously non-exec director uh, of the institute as well so um for the next half an hour or just possibly just over um, um we wanted just to talk to you a bit about the the role as a, of a non-executive director um on the board and um the reason for the for the webinar really is that historically in years gone by what we've done is that we may have put an article on linkedin and facilitate just encouraging people to come forward as as, as non-exec directors, but also just to, to kind of reach out as well to say if you've got any questions or anything like that about the role um, that, you know, to come forward with those. Now, sometimes those do come forward, people do come forward and ask those questions. And sometimes I think for those that are kind of slightly wavering as to whether to apply for the role, um, they in the end decide not to. And I suppose the purpose of today's web webinar really is, is to maybe give an expectation as to the role um, and why it could be beneficial to anybody that that does become a non-exec non director but also i think what we wanted to do as well um is answer any questions so um what we're going to do is um we're going to go through uh, i'm going to go th through some some information and I'm, um, we're going to go to the panel who i'm going to introduce shortly to to talk about um some of their experience of being a non-exec director and then i'm going to open it up to the questions and answers one thing is you probably have seen from the chat function is there is the function there within uh, the function there to to ask any questions and answers. So if you've got any questions and answers, please post them in there. Don't put them in the chat function, um, but just put them in the, in the questions and answers. And what I'll try and do at the end uh, of the webinar is pick up on those. If we've got sufficient time, I'll try and answer them all. If I haven't got all the, all the answers to all the questions, then what I will do um, is follow up on those. One thing is important to do, though, is if you um, are putting... Uh, some questions in there that you've got your identity on there that we know your email address so we can come back to you directly on any questions you've got on that so um, I'm going to start off then um, with our first slide really which um, is really giving you the agenda of, of the session that we're going to have um, and as you can see really it's it's mainly to do with the, the how what and why um, I've broken it down so for around 15 minutes or so I just want to talk through some of those elements as to why uh, well, fundamentally, how the, how the process works, um, what actually is involved um, and, and the expectations of, of a, a non-exec director of the Institute. Um, and then from a personal point of view uh, as to why it may be beneficial for you, for, for you to become a, a, a non-exec director really of the Institute. So I'm just going to go through those. But one first thing I'd like, like to do really is um, to introduce our panel to you. Um, so. Uh, very briefly in terms of myself, um, I my background in volunteering with the Institute um, goes back to around 14, 15 years ago when I helped volunteer with the what was the BIFM Lancashire Group. And then from there kind of um, was heavily involved with the Northwest and then the North region uh, of BIFM as it was um, and, and then became chair of, of the North region. And I did that role for about three and a half years. Um, and then if we rewind probably about five and a half years ago, there was some non-exec director elections and I wasn't really thinking of going really, didn't really cross my mind. And then I had a conversation with another volunteer that was on the committee said, why don't you go for it? Um, and at the 11th hour, uh, I decided to, and uh, I'm gonna talk to you a bit in a short time about why going, doing that at the 11th hour might not be the best strategy, but we'll come on to that in a minute. But um, from there, I was uh, fortunate to be elected onto the board as a non-exec director five years ago. Which, and I held the role for uh, for two years. And then for the last three years, um, what the board asked me to do is then to step up into the chair role, which um, I've done for the last three years. So I'm introducing the panel next. So I'm going to go to Simone, and Simone can give you just a, a bit of a, a, a potted history of her uh, journey on to becoming a member of the, the Institute board. Yeah, sure. Um, hi, everyone. So I think I joined Biffin back in 2012. Um, and did a lot of volunteering over the years um, and then got involved with SIG and the Workspace SIG a few years back. And then when I saw the NED role kind of come up, I spoke to a couple of people who uh, had been in NED 
um, and and an existing ED as well. And you know, I thought actually I fancy the new the new challenge, and that's kind of when I put myself forward. Um, I didn't get voted on the first year, and I kind of w- walked away and spat my dummy out a little bit and thought, right, okay, I'll I'll, I'll stick to being a volunteer then. Um, and then the second year, the year after, I thought, no, I'm I'm going to do it again, and then I was voted on. And in listening to most people, that is the norm. So even if you don't get voted on the first time, my point is don't don't give up if you want if you do want to get involved. Really, really good advice because abs- absolutely, Simone. There are members on the board right now that, are, like similar to yourself, that weren't successful first time, um, but did did um, decide that they'd like to be considered again uh, and, and were successful a second time. So um, thanks for that, Simone. Uh, Jake. Um, let's uh, if you could just explain a bit about your kind of journey onto the board, which I know is is very different to to Simone's, really. Yeah, no, thank you, Mark. Um, hi everyone, uh, good to see everyone here today. Um, so yeah, I, I, my, my name is Jake Drummond. I um, have been involved with the institute uh, since twenty fourteen, I want to say, um, but actually back in twenty fourteen, but it was different. Um, I was I was a studying member. I, I came through the qualification route, qualified, and got my qualifications through the BFM uh, uh, Academy uh, and actually this is my first volunteering experience so I mean my day job has always been very estates and facilities focused but actually this is my first volunteering experience um, actually as part of the Institute so um, I know that a lot of people who are on the board have been involved previously with volunteering that that's not my personal experience so I guess um, in a similar vein to Simone said, don't don't be put off if you know if at first you you don't succeed. Don't don't equally don't be put off by um, putting yourself forward uh, as an NED if if you've not previously been involved in, um, in in volunteering with the institute in any way. Because it's certainly not been a barrier for me. Brilliant. Yeah. Thanks, Jack. Really, really good point. Um, we 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 don't necessarily uh, we're not ne- just looking. Um, for volunteers it's it's um so you do it's, it isn't that isn't certainly is not a barrier to 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 becoming a non-exec director as, as jake is showing really so um first part is uh, the how. how 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 what's what is the process and this is really an, an important part of it and, and there's there's three things that i just want to um to really really stress um the first of, of which is that if if you are at that certified grade and and um you, you're eligible for it. You would have you would have received uh, an email from UK Engage. What we do uh, as good governance is that we have an independent body such as UK Engage that that, that arrange the elections, but also help us uh, arrange our annual general meeting, which is in July of, of, of each year usually. Um, but UK Engage would have sent an email. Now, if you haven't received that email, um, there's an email address at the bottom there, governance at iwfm.org.uk. Um, Please, can you email that address if you can't get your hands on that email from UK Engage? Um, because that will give you then access to the platform to then to, to, to nominate um, yourself for that particular role. So do, do 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 that. Don't leave it too late as well, which I'll come on to in a second. But that that is your route to kind of um, nominating. The second point I want to, want to make a, a point of as well is the fact that as well as nominate, you'll need a couple of... Um, uh, members of the institute at member grade or above to to kind of second your application um, and it's really really important that one obviously you get their agreement to do that before you are before you put their names down which is obvious but the second point is to make sure that they actually um, get the email from UK Engage and act upon it um, the reason reason I mentioned that, which goes on to the third point, is that, that the deadline is a week today. So it's five o'clock on the 10th of May. Um, and the worst scenario would be that you kind of put your nomination through at three o'clock on the Friday afternoon, but don't leave then sufficient time for your nominees to be able to log on or receive the email or, uh, and, and do their, their bit of it as well. So my advice really would be, if you are interested in, in applying, and I would encourage people to do so, do it as quickly as you can before that deadline. That allows our governance team in UK Engage just to make sure that all the, the, the boxes are ticked in terms of eligibility for yourself and those that actually that may be um, nominating you as well. So give yourself plenty of time to do that. It isn't an onerous exercise. It won't take ages 
to 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 do the nomination process and put yourself forward but just give yourself plenty of time to do it and as i say if unsure or you haven't received the emails then if you contact kate patterson um, um who's our company secretary at the governance at iwfm.org.uk email address they will kate uh, and the team there will, will be more than happy to uh to uh to sort you out on that one so that's the how um I suppose the important thing, which is again, is is um, something that we don't necessarily talk about too much, but I think is a really important part of this particular webinar is, is to say, well, what, what does it involve? Because some people might be put off thinking it's going to be too much of a time um, uh, consuming exercise. And I don't know whether my employees will be will be kind of um, supportive of doing that. Um, and I get asked a lot of questions uh, when I attend events with the Institute is to say, well, what's the time? What time can it is, you know? How, how much work is involved in, in 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 doing it so i just want to kind of just set a scene in terms of that to to get the expectation right so um in terms of the role of the uh, uh, of the ned um basically um the the the, the role of a non exec director um is essentially there to help with the institute in setting the strategy going forward so at this moment in time for example uh, the Institute's got a strategy of 2023 to 25, a three-year strategy um, of, of the direction of the Institute. And we, as, as, as members of that board, are there to really to hold uh, the executive team and the CEO, Linda House Manis of, of IWFM, um, to account for a de delivery of that and to receive regular updates within the board meetings of how that is um, and to analyse um, the effectiveness of the delivery on, on that strategy. Um, and the aims of the institute going forward those strategic aims um it is also important that we also have that level of scrutiny in terms of the financial performance because that's what we're where um, our responsibilities are in the board as well um so that we have visibility um of the accounts on a, um, every single board meeting and also as board directors have to sign off the annual accounts that are audited so um the other key part of of the role as well in terms of um of 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 it is um that we're there as ambassadors of the institute um it seems a grand phrase but basically we are there to represent the board and to be sharing with our networks uh, and the industry at large our role within the board and what they collectively what we as a as a board and, and what the institute uh, are aiming to achieve really um and to share uh, that um, both from a strategic point of view, um, but also in those conversations with other members um, of, 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 of the Institute, whether that be on volunteering um, uh, or the wider membership, really. Um, the other thing just to mention as well in terms of that is that although um, uh, we're all individuals within the board, we have a collective accountability. So, you know, our role is to, to challenge and to ask questions and if we want more information um, to help make those strategic decisions to ask of those but collectively those conversations form part within a board environment and that we make collective decisions as a collective body as such um, and in terms of that time commitments um, the key part of it is the fact that we have five board meetings per year um, most of them are in person um there may be one possibly two uh, that we will have on teams but invariably we try and meet in person um to have those meetings uh, the duration usually is most of the day to be fair uh, that we that the board meetings last um in advance of the board meetings so and this is a key part of it is that a week in 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 advance of the board meetings all the papers that we are needing to to read and understand and maybe ask questions in advance are there for us to review what, what we need to be doing is to read those in advance not the night before or or the morning of the board meeting is but but to, to, to be able to kind of read those papers now sometimes there can be board meetings that that there isn't a huge amount of of board papers to read other times there can be there can, there can be quite a number of them but in terms of that time commitment there is a need certainly um, for any non-exec director on the iwfm board um, to be reading those papers and understanding them and we do have a facility on teams that we ask questions in advance of the board if there's any clarifications that we want from the authors of, of those papers or indeed uh, any members of the executive or um, of IWFM. Um, finally in terms of the board meetings 
um, the board uh, meetings uh, usually center around certain parts of the calendar year in as much as that, for example, the first board meeting um, of the year is to review the end of year accounts for the previous year. Our, our trading year is January to December. Uh, we always also have um, uh, a strategy board meeting uh, in, in June or July of every year, and that is basically to review how the overall strategy is going, but also um, to provide a bit of insight in terms of future potential areas of strategic development for the Institute and opportunities. Um, a key element of, of that as well is, is bringing that insight that we have within within our own um, kind of networks and environments and working life to, to those particular sessions. So that insight is really, really important part of that non-exec director role as well uh, to bring fresh ideas and, and also to be kind of just a, um, aware of what's happening in the marketplace um, within the FM profession and the wider macro economy. So hopefully that's pretty straightforward. Um, why become an NED finally in terms of um, so I've done the how you apply, what's involved, and then kind of why become an exec director. Um, genuinely, from a personal point of view, um, I've learned so much in the last five years with being on the board of the Institute. Um, it, it's really, really insightful. And it, from my previous regional volunteering aspect, it's been really interesting then to be at the centre of, of the, that decision making and, and the driving forward some of the some of the some of the areas of, of uh, direction that we were wanting to follow really so it's it's an ability to influence but we're right at the center but it's is really really good in terms of the learning experience and the varied things that that uh, that we have experience of um second point like i mentioned there is setting that strategic direction is absolutely crucial it's a crucial role for each member of the board um also i suppose it's it's that ability as well to amplify what the institute's trying to do a key part of our strategic direction is being that professional voice uh, for workplace and facilities management, both within the UK and, and the wider um, wider global influence, really. But um, it's the ability to to raise the profile of the Institute and what we're doing. Um, and the non-exec director role is a really, really good way of doing that, really. Um, but, it, but as I say, the final, final one there in terms of why become, as well as learning um, and getting insights from other people, um, it's an opportunity as I mentioned before, to bring your own insight. We have regular horizon scanning sessions within the board meetings where we can bring that insight. And I think the important thing for us as a board is to have that diverse range of people, have been, uh, opinions, lived experiences that can bring that forward to the board so that um, we can we can have that variance of different um, views and insights and experiences, really. So that's a key part of it as well in terms of contributing to those board discussions and the insight sessions that we have. So. I'm really hopeful that's given a, a decent enough kind of insight in terms of what the role is. The final thing I would say in terms of time commitments is it's 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 difficult to kind of pinpoint number of days and, and, and hours as such. But just as a, as a final thing, just to reiterate, it's five board meetings per year. Um, it's also potential attendance at some of the, the, the events, but that is discretionary, you know, but sometimes it's good to be seen to be involved in some of those uh, events that may, may, be, may be held um, and time before those meetings um, to read the papers. From time to time, there will be email exchanges or asking to, to, to read something or to give opinion on something in between those board meetings. But those five board meetings per year in the papers is, is the main time commitment, I would say, in terms of that, that um, board commitment. Okay, so. I'm going to move on to the questions and answers, really, because you've had enough of 20 minutes of me um, waffling on. So I, I want to kind of now involve um, Simone and, 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 and Jake in a, in a wider discussion, really, um, and to give their experience of two relatively new members of the board. Simone's been on the board for coming up to two years. Um, Jake uh, who will, and Moses joined the board following the last AGM last summer. So they, they've been on. Uh, Jake and Moses have been on the board as our newest members for just less than 12 months. So I thought their insight um, would be extremely useful for the purposes of the, for the webinar, really. So um, I'm going to ask Simone first um, as to why you decided to become a non-exec director of the Institute. Hmm. I think for me, it was about progression for, for me 
personally, but then also how I can support Idle Fem further in, in the strategy. So I think obviously with the various volunteer roles that I've done over the years and speaking at a lot of the events and attending a lot of the events, I really wanted to get involved with the board to really see how I could help, I guess, push the, the workplace side of things forward, um, especially, you know, post post the name change. So I think it was really the the amplifier for me was to go and see how I could support and get involved and drive the direction. Okay. Thank you, Sine. What about you, Jake? What 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 kind of what was your rationale behind joining as a as a board member? <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Matt. Not not dissimilar to Simone, to be honest. I think for me personally, it, it, as soon as I knew about the institute and was involved in the institute's work and the, the moment that I, I first knew that um, members could could join the board as non-exec directors. I think it was an ambition of mine personally to to one day do that and, and to, I guess, make sure that I was in the right place in my own career journey um, to be able to bring the, the necessary kind of insight and experience to to the board. Um, but it, it, it's something that I've always thought that I wanted to do, but it was just for me about picking the right moment. So for me, that you know, that, that was last year. So this time last year, I was... In, in a very similar place to what uh, a lot of colleagues today will be uh, on the call and um, decided to take the plunge and uh, yeah was, was fortunate enough to to get elected onto the onto the board last year there we are. okay thanks Jake um, Simone um, what surprised you most about becoming um, coming onto the board um I think for me it was um it was, I guess, how much work goes on behind the scenes that previously as a volunteer you don't necessarily see. Um, I don't think I appreciated how much there is to juggle. And it is, you know, essentially like running a business, but then having a lot of lot of stakeholders in front of you and you're trying to please all of them stakeholders. So I think that was for me, you know, the the real eye opener. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. What about you, Jake, in terms of that surprise element? I think that's a really, a really interesting insight to learn. I, I agree. I think the, the, just building on that, I think for me, I, I was surprised. I don't know why I was surprised, really, but I was. I was surprised at how small the team is, I think, in the centre of IWFM and how much work they actually managed to get done, uh, you know, by, by what is actually quite such a small team. Um, you know they they do brilliant work, and I'm sure that members on the call, you know, we'll 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 see and uh, and sort of have lived experience of that work that the, the the small but brilliant team do day in day out. But but I think just seeing that in uh, in in reality was 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 a surprise, even though it perhaps shouldn't have been. I think the other thing that's um, surprised me a bit as well, uh, and and you know in a, in a good way and. Is, is around the whole kind of international dynamic I think that the Institute is 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 um, involved with now so you know there's been a couple of conversations at um, at board meetings this last year uh, where we've been you know considering the impact of uh, you know the Institute's work on the international stage which I think has been very interesting and uh, and also something that I, I perhaps wasn't expecting so um those are probably my, my reflections back okay Thank you. Simone, um, I, I alluded to this because with the time commitment aspect, because it's, as I say, it's, it's, a, it's a common um, question, but also a crucial in, um, consideration as well for anybody that wants to become a, a non-exec director, because the worst scenario would be that you apply and then realise what's involved and, and perhaps don't then have your support of your employers or you just simply don't have the time. So from, from, from your perspective, time commitment wise, how much of a time commitment is it to you? person um, i think there's the there's the base layer and then there's the, if you want to go above and beyond so i think from a base point of view um i'd say obviously there's the board meetings and like mike said five five a year and you know i guess they they're, they're a full day event and generally um you know i would probably dial into most of them and then attend in person um for at least a couple of the year um depending on where i am in the world and then i guess from a 
prepping the, the papers the night the night before I was gonna say is I was gonna say is don't do the night before like I did last week <laughs> because it's not ideal. Uh, you give yourself a little bit of stress when you don't need to. Um I try and do with the papers come out probably the week before. Um I try and kind of read them gradually over that week. Um if if it's been busy at week at work, sometimes you know reality hits and it is a last minute thing then you know, I guess it's a little easier to see how much of a time commitment the papers are. And, you know, you, you are talking a few hours to, of reading the papers to fully understand them. But I'd definitely say a week before is the best situation because then you can ask any questions and not necessarily bring really small points then to the board meeting. You can actually get that information in advance. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I'd, I'd say, you know, if you was going to put a, a number on it um, for kind of, if you were going to break it down for maybe, let's say quarterly for the sake of it, um, I'd be probably saying that it's it's probably be like an on eight to ten hours quarterly, I'd, from my estimations. Um, obviously with a few e of the emails in between. Um, but yeah, it's it it goes quite quickly. So I don't be put off by the time. I'm gonna say no. Thanks, Simone. Um, Jake, I'm gonna come to the next question really because I'm conscious I'm gonna, there's four questions that I'm gonna get to before we we finish the, the webinar. Um, but I, I'm I'm gonna ask you both, and I'll start. If with, with you jake in terms of um what do you enjoy most about the ned role oh there's loads that i enjoy about it i think meeting colleagues on the board has been great you know we've got a fantastic board uh with lots of, of diverse thought around the table which is exactly what the institute needs i think having that insight of the you know the the sheer scale of everything that the institute gets involved with and the longer term strategic direction, the the chancellorship journey, be one example, is uh, really fantastic to, to be involved with. So there's so many highlights, Mark, but th those are probably just a couple. No, thanks, Jake. And how about you, Simone? What, what kind of uh, yeah. what do you enjoy most about it? I think similar to Jake, really. I said, but I think it's it's being you know when you're in a say a corporate world, it's quite easy to become institutionalized and think in a certain way know the organisation, know the operations, and then make decisions based off that. Whereas I think in the NED role, you are making a very strategic decision based off the information in front of you. And you learn from the people that are sat, you just sat around the table with because, you know, there's different backgrounds. There's people from government, there's NHS, there's corporates. And it's, it's, a, it's really interesting for me to see how, each person has a different thought pattern around the same challenge and then you know collectively we come to a solution so i think for me that's the thing that i really enjoy about it thank you thanks simone yeah and i suppose the key thing to really really stress from from a board perspective is that every single member of that board's opinion matters and i don't mean that in a really cliched way but it's genuine that there is that collective responsibility for everybody to contribute their own um thoughts and ideas to to those discussions is absolutely crucial and it, it's for me as, as as chair of the board to make sure i facilitate that and encourage that within within the collective team so um i'm conscious of time but what i'm, I'm going to do thanks for thanks um simone and, and jake for your contributions on that i'm just going to just go through uh, the questions um and, and and answer those in the best way that i can um and what i want to start one of the questions asks about kind of um uh, problem statements or pain points and and what is it what is a new ned potentially coming in to solve so let me just rewind slightly on that and say that what we do as a board and we've just completed this exercise that we have a um a a, a skills matrix that we that we complete in terms of the competence and experience of those particular board members and we score those self-score those so that we have an indication as to where we think as a board we're really really strong in particular areas and where we may not be as strong um and and it, it's it's good process for any board to have that kind of um that skills analysis what we do from time to time and um is that we will bring in co-opted members onto the board who um will be co-opted non-exec directors but will give a specific insight um that will help us as a board collectively to have and expanded knowledge in certain areas. And, and, and what I mean by that is, for example, when we were going through the COVID situation and the financial pressures that all organizations um, were going through, um, we brought uh, a gentleman called Paul Ash onto the board as a co-opted non-exec director. Paul, uh, at that time, um, was the global president of the Chartered Institute of Management Accountants. So it was really, really 
wonderful to have onto the board in terms of insight, his insight on 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 the financial governance uh, um, of, of of the institute. Um, more recently, um, we've um, uh, co-opted Rod Lennox, who was previously on one of our committees, the uh, um, Nominations and Remuneration Committee. But Rod is a non-FM person, but he's brilliant at horizon scanning and knowing what's exactly going on within within the the kind of the economy but very much from a HR perspective as well, because that's his specialism. So one of the questions on there is how many members are there on the board? Uh, and uh, generally there are 10 uh, members onto the board. Um, within the board meetings as well, um, members of the IWFM executive uh, are, are invited as well, and there's four members of the executive that join us. Um, but in terms of the, um, the people on the actual board itself, um, we have Linda, CEO, we have Kate, who's our finance director, and then the rest are either elected or co-opted uh, non-exec directors. So that's one of the questions. Um, uh, I was going to answer where the meetings are held, but I can see that Simone, it says here, is typing an answer. So she might get in there be before me. So um, um, Maud's got a great question. Um, what do you think is the most awesome part and the most frustrating part of being a non exec director um i think the learning for me is the most awesome part um if even if i wasn't chair from my time as a non-exec director um i've i've learned so much and it's just so good um to be involved and to work collaboratively with the the team um, at iwfm really to to try and just set the agenda and going forward and where uh in that kind of my insight is is valued as part of that. Um, Simone and Jake, uh, I know we've kind of asked about the what you enjoy most frustrating part. What's and all? What's the most frustrating part? Simone, what do you think from that one? I think it's um I think it goes back to the the eye opener bit of people not seeing what happens behind the scenes. Um, there's a lot maybe of assumptions that certain things are not done, and I find that frustrating because. There is so much that is done behind the scenes um, and so much kind of due diligence as well. And I think that stuff that's not seen, that can be frustrating because she's constantly almost trying to justify, no, no, we do do that. No, we do that. No, we do that. Um, so I think that can be frustrating at times. Yeah, and that's, a, that's a really good point. And I think there is that perception sometimes, and I've come across it over the years, where you just think that, the, the impression is the criticism is that the board are there just as not nodding dogs to to Linda and the executive and it isn't like that at all um and the fact that we we kind of an important part of it is is um setting that strategic direction and giving that insight and holding Linda and the exec to account for it in a in a, in a professional constructive way but in the same token we are there to to get the answers that we need and, and to challenge um mm -hmm along the way how about you jake what's what's kind of a, do you do you share that similar frustration or is there something else that you can think of i, I do i do um i think the the i think my, my reflection um though mark is is around the, the profile of the institute within the sector and the and the fact that i mean don't get me wrong we've done so much work over the last 10 years to to continue to raise the profile and we're in you know a totally different space now but I think there's still a perception amongst some of our uh, professional colleagues that perhaps in other uh, professional institutes um, that the IWFM, I don't think there's a recognition that the IWFM covers such a vast range of disciplines. And I think there's still some work for us to, to do there in terms of educating the wider sector and the wider industry in terms of the, the sheer scale of what the IWFM is all about. Yeah, I think that's a, a bit of a bugbear, man. Brilliant. Thanks, Jake. Um, I'm going to allow Simone in a second to answer the question from Claire about living in Germany, which is a really interesting point. So, but before I ask Simone to just to answer that one, um, um, somebody's asked the question about how long the term of an NED is, which is a really, really good point. So uh, if, you st if you stood for election as a non-exec director of the Institute, the term is for three years um so at, at the end of that three-year period then you get um the, the the option to either step down off the board if if that you know you you've, you've got other things you want to do in, in terms of your volunteering um or you have the opportunity to stand 
again in the election at that particular time um, to 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 become an, uh, a non-exec director for a further three years. That is the maximum turn as a non as a non-exec director that you are able to do. And I, I suppose if we quote some examples currently on the board, is that. Um, Marilyn Stanley um, has been on the board for the last six years uh, and she finishes her term of office um, this this year, which is why we're holding the elections, because there's a vacancy, there's a vacancy there. Um, but we have members of the board like Andrew Holbert, for example, that served his initial three years and then has stood again last year for re-election onto the board. So we had three vacancies last year. There was the, which Jake, Moses and, and Andrew. Build. Um, but they have to go through that same process if you're standing for re-election for that second term of three years um, to, to go through the same election process. And it's up to the members to decide whether they want that person to continue on the board or somebody else instead. So, yeah, I hope that answers that query. Um, Simone, um, Claire's question. I live in Germany. How feasible is it for someone who lives outside of the UK to become an NED, given that they may not be able to attend meetings in person? Excellent point. And Simone, over to you to give that insight. Yeah, um, so I think from a personal point of view, um, I do travel kind of globally with my role. Um, sometimes I will dial in to meetings. Um, it's not a challenge. Um, I previously worked for a Canadian company and I did a couple of, of the, the NEDs from Canada. Um, and then currently we've got David Carey, who is based in UAE. Um, so he will dial in. Um, I think I've only met David maybe once in person um, over the like, last few years, and that's just coincidence that it was over and when the, the board meeting was happening um so it's absolutely feasible and it's actually something i'd really encourage because i think it's really really important to get that international perspective and i think we don't just want that uk focus so i would definitely encourage people from other countries as well to put themselves forward yeah absolutely simone um and i think just on that on that um on that point yeah it's really important for us that that if we do get an insight um, but also it could be an opportunity for us to to potentially open new new uh, membership opportunities further afield in the regions that maybe one of the NED um, uh, are based as well. So, uh, yeah, it, it is absolutely fundamentally no no barrier. Um, we, we do have that regular meetings as well as David Carey. There are some times when people can't attend in person. So clearly we have um, a mixture of both people there in the room and also people that are dialing in from wherever in the world that they are. So yeah, it, it, it fundamentally isn't a barrier. Um, the biggest challenge facing the board is is one um, that I would uh, I'll just kind of finish the questions on because it's it, it's it's a really really good one. Um, and I suppose that as a board and as an institute, our biggest challenges are to grow the membership and um, and. Um, also to to be to be financially uh, an ongoing concern it's, it's fundamentally part of, of what the, if the institute wasn't it wouldn't exist that biggest challenge for the institute uh, is the fact that membership is not is a discretionary spend for all of us so we don't for our jobs we don't have to be a member of iwfm whereas some certain professions you do have to be a member of that professional body or a chartered body um so that discretionary spend element is is quite a challenge because we've got to work really really hard to be able to show to members that they're getting value for money and that they are worth it's worth renewing and and for years we've had really good strong retention rates but it is a, a challenge it's also a challenge in terms of, of what what we need to do is to to grow that membership in other other areas as well um, and having new members come on board and and I think you know that's part of the role of of the board is understanding well where are those opportunities. Where can we grow the influence of of, um, of the institute, and also um, where can we find new revenue streams potentially? How can we increase um, our offering to members? And that's a that's an evolving process of which the board are absolutely crucial to it. So I think that's probably probably the biggest challenge that we've got as as a board and as a, an institute generally in terms of that is that that membership vote. It's that um, membership sorry numbers, but also the kind of just making sure that. Uh, you know, budgets are tight with any professional organization and that money spent wisely and we have the impact that we need to do and that we get the revenue in so i think that's probably probably that um so um i'm conscious of time and people's probably uh tummies are probably rumbling at this particular point because we did say half an hour and we're we're now 41 minutes into it so i just want to want to finish really first of all 
um, to thank every one of you to, for joining us. I hope it's been really, really useful. I hope it's given you a bit of an informal insight as to what is involved in becoming uh, a non-exec director on, on, on the board. As I mentioned at the start, um, you've got a week. So it's this time next week it's at five o'clock is a cutoff point. So I'd really encourage you, if it's something that really interests you, do 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 go for it. Uh, I, I I think the flavour of what the three of us have hopefully talked about this afternoon has given you that indication actually that, that it is a it is a fulfilling role uh, and interesting um, uh, opportunity really. I think I want also want to just to, to thank Simone and Jake for for the, their time and insight really. Um, I was really important really important to me as well as the informality is is that it wasn't me just blathering on for forty one minutes that we had some insight from. Um, from from Simone and Jake, so thank you both for your for your time in this uh, this afternoon. Um, the final thing, really, I just want to mention to everyone is before you, before you leave, um, on that final screen is my email address. Um, if you've got any questions between now and um, um, five o'clock next week, then just just getting please do get in touch, and, and I'll do my very best to answer those. There may be something that you thought actually I should have asked for that or asked about that, or there may be something that you weren't comfortable putting in the Q&A, but would like just to, as a follow up. So I'd encourage you to do that and, and to come forward. The final thing, um, as also is once you go and if you if you do apply for that um, um, to go to be a non-exec director as well, um, as Simone and Jake uh, have alluded to right at the start, if you were un unsuccessful, for example, the first time around, don't be put off. There is opportunities again in because we have a churn of NEDs because of that fix because we stagger it in terms of those terms of office that there will, will be opportunities to stand for election, but also the fact that there may be other opportunities to volunteer within the institute as well. Uh, we do have other committees, we do have special interest groups, we have regions, and we have working groups as well. So there's always that opportunity potentially to volunteer in other areas as well if you weren't successful being on the board. But um, I hope you do apply. I wish you the very best of luck if you. Uh, do decide that you'd like to stand for election um, and thanks again for your time and um, hopefully uh, um, see you or speak to you at some point in the future so thanks for your time